ever been through because my life's not been bad. I've, I've not had a life where I've been into alcoholism or I've been into drugs or I've done these things. I've not been that way. I've been around church my entire life. I tell everybody I have a drug problem and it catches their attention and I tell them I was drugged to church every time it was open and that was my drug problem in life. But I thank God for that life and I want us to grasp what it truly means to go after God. I'm going to say some things that may offend you, and I hope they don't. But if they do, it's the old saying, if the shoe fits, we got to wear it. Amen? And today I want to share some things with you that I believe is happening in our world today. The number one thing I believe of the problem in the Christian world today is we want just enough God to stay out of hell. We want just enough of Jesus to where I'm not going to go to hell. I need my fire insurance. So I'm going to go to church every once in a while when I feel the need and I'm starting to feel bad inside. I'm going to go to church, get my fix, and try to get myself a little further down the road. And, 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 and honestly, folks, it's the most frustrated living that you can possibly do. It's the weakest living that you can possibly do. And it's the most neediest living that you can do when you just dabble in and dabble out. But we have a Christian world today that seems to just want enough just so I don't go to hell. Now, that may offend you. I'm sorry if it does, but that's the truth. There's a lot of people in our world today, especially Christians like uh, uh, that we, we just talked about that are living in our world today. We have gained an appetite for the world, and we've gotten used to spiritual dieting. Let me say this. I'm going to say it my way. We're fat from the world and skinny from the word. We've gotten to a place to where we're getting so much of the world inside of us, we're beginning to like it. Uh-oh. It's quiet in here. We're getting so much involved with the world, so much in the entertainment of the world, so much of what the world has to offer us, we're getting so involved in that that we're getting to a place to where we're beginning to like it. And what suffers is the word. And what suffers is our relationship with God. And what suffers is our lives because we're not connected with him the way that we need to be connected with him to get everything and get all the benefits that he has for us. Our desires have sat, uh, shifted from the desires to go after God and find him to the desires of both the world to see what the world has to offer. We've been trained, and I wrote this down because while I was praying this morning, God spoke this into me. We've been trained by the New Age preaching and teaching. We've been trained that you can have both. You can live in the world and still have God. You can still go do all these sinful things and just go because grace will cover you and it'll be okay. We have a message out there that is very deceiving, and we're living in a deceiving time. And the church world is failing because the word is not in them. The problem is you can't ride a barbed wire fence. It causes too much pain. I don't know if you've ever got caught up in a barbed wire fence out in the field trying to get across somewhere. I've been caught in them before, and there's nothing more miserable because it seems like you get out of one barb and another one grabs a hold of you, and before you're done, you're all scratched up and you're hurting and bleeding everywhere. Amen? You cannot ride in the middle of this thing. God is saying you're either all in or you need to get all in. Amen? So again, the Holy Spirit is like Elvis. He's left the building. I believe this with all my heart, that God is, is warning us that we have begun to preach and teach through these last few years. We keep leaving the Holy Spirit out of everything we do, everything we preach. we got to be politically correct. we got to be careful. I wrote this down. Our pulpits have left the Holy Spirit out. Christians want to do their own thing so much. That they don't want the voice of the Holy Spirit in their lives. The Holy Spirit presents an opposition to the way they want to live. He's not politically correct, and he's not socially acceptable. The Holy Spirit's not accepted in this world today. People don't even want to talk about the Holy Spirit anymore because, oh my God, you might start talking about tongues. 
And I'm thinking to myself, Lord, how much are you missing of the God of the Holy Spirit who does everything that needs to be done, who is the gift of God that was given to us when Jesus Christ finished his works on the cross, went into heaven and said, now I'm going to give you something better than, than I could even do on this earth. And now the Holy Spirit, God, is living within us and the power of the living God is right inside of us. How can we not want to talk about the Holy Spirit? How can we not want to preach about the Holy Spirit? How can we not want to accept his convicting power? I don't know about you, but I don't like conviction. It bothers me. It causes me suffering. It causes me pain. But guess what? It's the best thing for me is the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. Keeps me right where I need to be. We have forgotten how empty life is without God. I don't know about you, but life is so empty without God. I have so many times got into a situation where I go into a situation, into a family, whether it's a death or whether it's a, a bad situation, and you go into that situation, and none of them recognize God. None of them know God. None of them have God involved in their life. And I sit there, and my heart is broken because I'm thinking to myself, how much we need God. God. If they would just grasp how much they needed God and took hold of him and went after him, this situation that they're going through right now, again, whether it's a death, whether it's a bad situation in the family, if they had God in the center of their life, they would not handle it the way they were. There's so much hopelessness without God. There's so many things out there. If we don't have him in our lives, man, if we don't have the presence of God in our lives, we're going to be searching for hope. We're going to not have any peace. There's not going to be any joy around until we get God fully active in our lives. We need him. Look at your neighbor and say, man, I need him. We need him in our lives, active and among the land of the living. Amen. We need him there. And he's willing to do that. Israel is an example of living without the presence of God. You go to 1 Samuel chapter 4, you're going to find out when the Ark of the Covenant was taken from them, and the Ark of the Covenant re represented the presence of God. When the presence of God was taken from Israel, things got really bad. Really bad. As I look at the church world today, things are really bad in the church world. Now, I'm not, I'm not down in the church world. How many know the church is victorious? We're going to win this thing. Amen? Amen. The gates of hell cannot come against us and stop us from what God's got planned for us. Amen? But I'm telling you, there is trouble in the home. Satan has slowly creeped in, and he has done something to where he has actually taken the ark, or he has taken the presence of God out of the church. I see more churches today that are so powerless and, and, and God showed me this, and, and Doc obviously traveled and all he's traveled, but, but God showed us this through traveling and singing for 35 years in every church denomination, every church you could think of, from Catholics to Amish, I don't care, you name me a, a denomination, we've been there, we sang there, and I'm telling you now, through the years, God showed me slowly but surely how we were turning into nothing but a doctrine, nothing into what we think man thinks it should be and we have gotten so far away from this and we have gotten to the place to where the presence and power of God cannot even exist in the church I can remember as a kid and you may say well you shouldn't go back to those days well yeah you should because I can remember as a kid walking into the church and I'm talking a five six seven year old kid walking into church and the power of God was so strong that me as a five or six year old or seven year old kid knew I need to keep my mouth shut there's something special in this place I don't want to talk I don't want to move I don't want to do anything wrong and I would watch the power of God move in such a special way that it looked like a fog would come in over the building that's the power I'm talking about, and that's the power that God said, I am going to restore in my church. It's coming. It's already here. We just need to accept it. And the way we accept it is we get to a place to where we go after him. We go after him. 
If we had the heart of David, and again, you can read in 2 Samuel 5 and 6, read both of those chapters because it's awesome. The first thing David did when he took over as king, he said, we got to get the ark back. We got to get the presence of God back into Israel. Man, we, we got to get it. And David set his mind on that, and David went after the ark. He went after the presence of God. He said, I'm not doing anything. We're not doing anything. We're not going in anywhere. Not doing now, there's a lot of things that happened when they got the ark. We won't go into those things. But today, I want you to understand David's heart was set on getting the presence of God back to Israel. Now, I don't know about you, but my mind is set that God, I want him first in my life. I want the Holy Spirit power moving in my life. I want to be able to speak things that need to be spoken to and the Holy Spirit do what needs to be done. And I believe that can happen if we go after God, if we go after him. Go with me, if you will, and hold that spot. Philippians chapter 3. We're going to read something there, and I'm going to share some things with you, but... What does it mean to go after something? I, look, I looked up a few things. It says to chase or follow someone in order to catch them. To be bold, to be dynamic, to be energetic, to be forceful, to be tough and vigorous is how you go after something. We all have personal things that we went after in our lives. I remember the first time I met my wife, I saw her out in the field. She was cutting some grass. And right here, something said, you got to go after that. You got to go after that. I'll be gentle. And I set my mind to go after her. I did things that I not, never thought I would ever do to go after her. When I woke up in the morning, guess what? My first thought was, how do I go after her today? When I went to bed at night, guess what my last thought was? Did I do enough to go after her today? Come on. Some of you need to think back when you first fell in love, amen? Amen. Y'all go home now and you can turn music on and say, let's think about back in the day, man. See, I'm restoring things into your life right now. But I truly, in my heart, man, I went after her. And God began to speak to me and said, why do you not go after me like that? She loves you, and she can take care of the things that you need, and she'll do her best. She'll go to her extremities, but she has extremities, and I don't. Why do you not go after me? Why do you not go after me? And I wrote these six things down. These are quick six things, just some reasons why we should go after him. Number one, to get to know him, to have a relationship with him. Why would we not want to get close to God? Why would I not want a relationship? Why would I not want to get close to a God who's a God of all gods, king of all kings, who loves me so much that he sent his son to die for me, and he has me in the palm of his hand, everything that happens around me he's involved with, and he's watching on me. Why in the world would I not want to know him? The second thing, real quick, to be justified or made right. I'm no longer guilty, and I am guilty, amen? amen? I'm saved by the grace of God and the love of God, man. I need to understand that he justifies me. He makes me right. There's nothing right about Tim A.G. There's nothing right about me. And, and, and then when I get in God, everything is right. Amen. He justifies everything. Then I got to share in his power and love. So that our lives can be powerful and full. Why would I not want a powerful life in God? Why would I not want to lay hands on the sick and see them recover? Why would I not want to pray over my financial need and God say, don't worry about it. I got it covered. Bam, here's your blessing. Amen. 
Why would I not want that in my life? To share in his power and his love. To live in victory. Even when it looks like I'm losing. Come on, folks. We need to be shouting right here. Why in the world would I not want to get close to God and go after God that even though my life may be in a bad situation, guess what? I'm still winning. When I see a saint of God take their last breath, and Lord, I've seen that hundreds and hundreds of times. When I see a saint take their last breath, and Satan goes, I got him. And I think to myself, oh, no, you didn't get him. He was saved by the power of the living God. He just changed addresses. Now he's living in glory forever. Even in my death, I win. Why would I not want to serve that God? Why would I not want him living and, and, and alive in my life? We are so imperfect. Now, some of you may think you're perfect. I know people that may think they are. I've always said this, and I believe this with all my heart. You think you're glorified and you think you're perfect, don't take a shower for about three weeks. You're going to find out how human you are, amen, and how imperfect you are. And if you don't find out, somebody going to tell you, Amen. And I say this all the time, we are slowly, even in our physical bodies, we're decaying. We're imperfect. But guess what? God is perfect. And guess what? God said, I'm leaving you, I'm leading you to perfection. Every day of your life, I'm going to do things, I'm going to speak things into you and lead you towards perfection. And the last thing before we go into the, to the meat of the message, this is free right here, amen. <laughs> Why would I not want to serve him? Because he loved us so much, he gave all that he had to adopt us. Do you realize you are a child of the king? Do you realize the benefits that you have that Satan does not want you to look at or even know you have? Do you realize that in, in the mully grubs that you may be living in right now, that you have to understand that God has adopted you through the power of Jesus Christ and what he did at the cross? And when you accepted him, you were engrafted and you were adopted into his family. You took on his name. Satan is afraid of you. Come on. He's afraid of you. He just wants to bull you and bluff you into not knowing who you are and what you have. And I say this all the time, man, if Christians could ever, I would love to have the sanctuary full of people who know who they are in God. Let me tell you something. If you, we have a church like that, and I believe we're getting there, we have a church like that, there can't be nobody sick walk in here because when they walk in here, they're going to get healed. Amen. I believe with all my heart God is moving in such a direction and everything is falling on us. What are you going to do? I've done everything I can do. God's saying I gave you everything that I could possibly give you. Everything is in your lap, in your hands. What are you going to do with it? Are you going to put it in cruise control? Or are you going to go after him? Let me read to you Philippians 3. We're going to read 7 through 14, I think, somewhere in there. I'm reading out of the New King James. Here's what it reads. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things. And count them as rubbish. Now, we know that as we translate further and further, we use nicer words. The actual words that he used was dung. Doo-doo. I count everything as dung. It's human waste. Everything that is not of God is human waste to me. Come on. That I may gain Christ. Now see, don't, don't miss that. He counts all that that way because he knows he has to count it that way to gain Christ. And be found in him. 
not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is of God, from God by faith. Verse 10, that I may know him. Ooh, hang on to this. And the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. If by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead, not that I have already attained or am already perfected. He's telling you, I ain't there yet. But I press on. Let's change that. But I go after. I press on. I go after that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things that are above and ahead of me, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I go after those things. Paul says, I'm going after it. I've been going after it. I'm going to continue to go after it. I'm not going to quit till I get it. There are three things I want to share with you. Things that I believe we must do to go after him. These things are so important for us to grab a hold of. And and, and if you're taking notes or, or, or you have your phone, and please, I hope your phone's on silent. If you have your phone, take pictures of the notes. I don't care. I want this to get inside of you. If you miss something this morning, go home and study it. Because I believe it's something that will encourage you, will help you, and get you to a place to where you have a drive inside of you. How many know we need a good Holy Ghost drive in us to get back? to where we need to be in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's look at develop a disdain, develop a disdain for the world and sin. Let me tell you something. When we read the scripture, and I want you to go with me, I want you to read this with me. Go to John, 1 John. First John 15 through 17. I want to show you something here. Do not love the world or the things in this world. If anyone loves this world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world... Grab a hold of this. We're going to talk about this. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. I want to share some things with you I believe will help us today, and I want you to grab a hold of this. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that some people are beginning to like the world and like sin too much. How many know you can do something so long and the Holy Spirit first started out convicting you and telling you, man, you need to stay away from this. Man, you need to be careful of this. But you keep doing it and you keep doing it and you continue to do it. And all of a sudden now it's in your home, it's in your life, and it's become normal to you. I believe we've gotten to that place sometimes in a lot of areas of our life. And we need to understand what it means to fight against these three things that we're going to talk about right now. You know, God hated it. I I got on the uh, Internet and I I just began to type in how how, uh, scriptures that says God hates sin. There were so many of them I couldn't even get them all down. And I I got some of them here. I'm not going to read any of them. But I'm thinking to myself, if God hates sin so much, why don't we? What's wrong? Well, we know what's wrong. There's a constant battle between flesh and spirit. And guess what? We're feeding flesh a whole lot more than we're feeding spirit. 
And the flesh is overriding the spirit, and now we're living more in the flesh than we are in the spirit. Separating us farther and farther from God. And as I look at this, I'm going to share this with you because uh, uh, I, I had to type it out. I, I, man, God just overfilled me with this thing right here, and i got to share it with you. In the Bible, the term world refers to the earth and the physical universe, and we can find that in, in Hebrews, John, we can go on down the list. But in most uh, of the time, it refers to the humanistic systems. That is at odds with God. That's constantly fighting against God. That's the world that, that we're talking about most of the time. When the Bible says that God loved the world with all of his heart, it's referring to he loves the humans in the world. Don't get confused by that scripture thinking, well, he loves the world too. No, he, he hates the world. He hates the things of the world. He hates the system that's against his system. He hates that. When we are told not to love the world, the Bible is referring to the words corrupt value system. Don't love corrupt things. Satan is the God of the world. He's the God of corruption. He's the God of sin. He's the God of all these things out there that are adverse or have adversity against God. He's the God of those things. And he has, in his own way, he has a system that's contrary to God's. One of his, I, I love this because it's so true, Satan's system works on three levels. These three levels right here we just talked about. He uses it all throughout the Word of God. It's been successful. He'll never change it. It's going to work every time. If we're not where we need to be spiritually, one of these three things will lead us to the, to the other, and we will fail. That's the lust, lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. Every sin imaginable can be summed up in these three things. It's in the Scripture. It's everywhere that you look. It's how the devil works. Let me talk about the lust of the flesh real quick. The desire of the flesh and the desire of the spirit is always at war. We're always fighting. That thing inside of us, that turmoil inside of us where the Holy Spirit's trying to get us to see and do the right thing and the world's pulling us this way and man, we're being drug over here in this situation and, and now uh, and we start saying, well, this, this ain't really bad over here and all of a sudden we begin to lean that way and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit's saying, no, 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 don't go over there. There's a constant warring going on. And the winner is who we feed the most. The winner is who we feed the most. As we abide in God's word, we will manifest the fruit of the spirit and we will overcome the world. The lust of the flesh is part of the worldliness driven by the desires for worldly selfish pleasures. Everybody has it. Let me tell you something. You may be a, a goody two-shoe. You may think you've already attained and you've got to a place in God where, let me tell you something, you will never get away from these three things. You will have to deal with these. You will constantly have to look within yourself and say, how much of this worldly desire do I still have in me? How many self, uh, selfish pleasures do I have still that need to be broken down and taken away, which draw our hearts away from God and ultimately lead us to death? Lust is an intense desire for an object or a, a circumstance. It can be sexuality. It can be money. It can be power. We want to indulge ourselves to increase ourselves. How many know that at the heart of this, lust desires to take, love desires to give? Totally the opposite. And here we are, we're dealing with this, and we got to look at this in our lives. If we ever want to get a disdain for the world, we have to understand that we have got to go before God with our lust of the flesh. Lord, break me down. God, put me where you need to put me to take this selfish desire away from me that I'm wanting something, God, that you don't have planned for me. 
Then we have the lust of the eyes. Listen to this. The lust of the eyes does not come from God, but comes from the world. This sinful desire, listen now, this sinful desire to go after what we see comes from the world because the world wants us to covet the things that we do not need or the things that are harmful to us. As we look at things, how how many of you, don't raise your hand, please don't raise your hand. How many of you have looked at something and you thought, man, I want that? Not even a thought of what that will do to me or what that will cost me. It just looks good. And I want it. That's something that's inside of every one of us that's there. You're going to deal with it on a daily basis. Satan knows that it's something that you have inside of you. So he loves to put those pretty things out there. And test your eyes. Yeah, it is. Good preaching, Pastor. He parades beautiful things in front of us so he can catch our eye. Because once he catches our eyes, he's got us thinking and got us moving in that direction. So here we are. As an example, Eve committed the sinful desire of the lust of the eyes. And this is what it says in the scripture. When the woman saw, when the woman saw that the fruit was good of the tree for for food and it was pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom. uh Uh-oh, we'll go back to the lust of the flesh here. Now she saw not just with her eyes, she's seeing it with her flesh. She's saying, man, it's good for me because I can be like God now. The very first deceitful sin trick of the devil was these three things right here. He set the tone. I'm going to go after these three things in every way I can. So now here's Eve. She's done, done what she's done, and she's got it, and she's, she's done into the lust of the flesh. The world wants us to see the glamour. Advertisement is about what you see. I did advertisement all my life. The first thing you do when you sit in a meeting with a company and you're talking about promoting them and you're talking about uh, marketing them and you're talking about that, the first thing you say is we got to get something people can see. Once they see it, they'll start to grasp it. They'll grab a hold of it. They'll work toward it. They'll go after it once they see it. Let's talk about the pride of life, the very sin that resulted in Satan's expulsion from heaven. You can read it in Isaiah chapter 14 was the arrogant boasting and and that sinful pride that he had. Some people will refuse to look at pride in their life. Men, I'm going to speak to you for a moment. We are bad about covering our pride. We're bad about having pride and calling it, I have to have that because I'm a man. We have to be real careful in this area of our lives because uh, I believe this. The very sin that resulted Satan's expulsion from heaven was pride. He desired to be God, not to be a servant of God. The arrogant boasting which constitutes the pride and and motivates the other two lusts, it will motivate the other two lusts, our pride will, as it seeks to elevate ourselves. Above all other things, it is the root cause of strife in families, strife in churches, and strife in nations. Pride is that thing. It exalts itself uh, in, in, in uh, direct contradiction to Jesus' statement that those who would follow me will take up the cross, deny themselves. It's the opposite of that. The pride of life stands in our way. If we truly seek to be servants of God and get close to God and get to know him, it is the arrogance that separates us from others and limits our effectiveness in the kingdom. It makes us fruitless. If I'm hung up on my pride and I'm not doing what God wants me to do and I'm not going after God because of this, this, and this so I can elevate myself, guess what? I become fruitless. I'm not bearing any fruit. 
I'm not growing the kingdom. I'm not serving God like I should be serving him. The pride of life is the love of self and the disdain of anything else that tries to kill self. If we can't get past our pride, we'll never go after God like we need to. We'll still be focused on ourselves. These three sins, and the reason why I wanted to bring them up today is because these things we need to start having a disdain for. We need to have a disdain for these three things and begin to really see them. The world and sin go together like a hand in glove. Some have been fooled to not see the sin in their lives because they have become so worldly. Both Adam and Eve faced the battle of the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And they failed, and we were separated from God. The world is deadly, and we cannot go after God if we are losing the battle against these three things. But in John 16, listen, Jesus reminds us that he has overcome the world. This means he showed us how to overcome the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. He gives us hope that we can defeat these three things through him. Satan even tried the ta tactic on Jesus when he was tempted on the mountain. Do you realize those are the three things that he went after with Jesus? He said, man, I'm going to show you this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deal with how, how you are inside. And then I'm going to also see where your pride's at. Jesus dealt with all of those. And guess what he did? He handled it perfectly because he threw the word on it. He knew exactly how to handle those things. And Jesus has a disdain for those three things. Now, I don't know about you, but you may be here today and you may be saying, man, there are certain things in my life I just don't want to give up. I don't, I don't, want, the, I don't want those things to go away. I, I've gotten used to those. They're part of my life. And, and, and I'm just praying. Let me, let me tell you something. Don't ever get caught where, and Doc and I was talking about this. We know this person, where, where this person's living in sin. Flat out living in sin, scripture, show them right here it is on this verse. You're doing this and you are sinning. And this person said, well, God will just have to understand. Let me tell you something. God understands. He understands you're living in sin and there's a consequence for that. And we know that God does what he does. And I'm standing here today and I'm trying to get us to understand when I talk about having a disdain for these things, I mean we need to have a consciousness about us that says, number one, I refuse to allow the devil to creep in and start to get inside of me and cause me to want things I shouldn't be wanting. Some of us need to look at our desires and say, are my desires in the right place? Do my desires line up with the scriptures? Some of us need to look and say, okay, man, I need to put some blinders on here. I need to, maybe I need some really dark glasses in this situation. I don't need to be seeing this. How many know the devil's not going to prance something in front of you that you don't like? Oh, he knows what you like. He's going to dress it up, paint it up. Perfume it up. Put it right in front of you. Woo! And guess what? We have to deal with it. I believe with all my heart that God is going to get his people right. He's going to have a remnant of people who are going to begin to do these things and begin to get into a place. And man, is he going to open up heaven. Man, I am so excited about what God is getting ready to do. But folks, we have got to develop a disdain for the world and sin. The second thing I want to share with you is stop living in the past. Oh my gosh. How can I go after something when I'm standing still waiting for something out of my past? 
How can I move towards God when I'm standing still because of a divorce that I had or a death that I had or a relationship that didn't work out or finances that didn't go the way it did or the business that God said he'd give me and it didn't work out? How in the world can I go forward when I'm holding on, reaching back to that? Paul says that I forget about those things and I press on. I move forward. I go toward that. How in the world can we go forward when we're stuck somewhere and we're just, we can't get out of our past. We can't get out of that divorce. We can't get out of that loss that I had. We can't get away from this thing. I'm stuck and I can't move forward. How many know that God has already taken care of your past? Let me, let me get down to reality here first. How many of you can go back and take the last second of your life and fix it? We can't. And God's sitting on the throne and saying, so why are you trying to do it? Why are you worried about the sins of your past? Why, are you keep, why do you keep telling yourself you can't be this because of what you used to be? Because God sent his son, Jesus, to die on the cross for you and do the finished works of Jesus Christ on the cross so that you can move forward and not have to even think about your past. It's in God's hands. Come on now. we got to move forward. I'm going to say this because God spoke this into me just now. Some of us can't move forward because we're thinking about what happened to us last week. God's saying, man, I got something good for you right now, but you can't seem to get past what happened to you last week. And guess what? You're not going to fix that. It's already gone and done. It's finished and over. It's part of your history, and you're not going to change it. So why are you hanging out there when I got something better over here? Go after it. Go after it. Last thing I want to share with you, and I believe it will help us, truly help us. This is the desire of my heart from the deepest depths of my heart. This is my desire. Live to please God for what he's done. Live every day to please God. Not please man. Not please my boss. Not please the owner of my company. Not please uh, uh, my spouse. Not please this. The focus is off there when we get to that place. And there's so many scriptures that tell us when you do things, do it unto the glory of God. Get up every day and say, Lord, what can I do to please you? Lord, when my day is over, can I sit at the edge of my bed before I lay myself down to go to sleep at night? Can I say, God, I feel like I pleased you today. To get up in the morning and make that my focus that I want to please him. If you want to write these scriptures down, I'm going to read some things to you. Because this is how I see us pleasing God. John 8, 29 says this. And he who sent me, Jesus said this, and he who sent me, he has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. If Jesus said, everything that I do, I do it to please God. If Jesus said it, my friend, we need to pay attention to it because it must be pretty important to everything that I do. I do it to please God. So the first thing we need to understand about pleasing God and how do I do that is we need to begin to be more like Jesus and understand that Jesus did those things because it pleased his father. Somebody asked me the other day, well, you think Jesus did things he didn't want to do? And I said, no, I don't. And they said, well, he was human. I said, let me tell you something. He was human, but he was so close to God, and he had such a relationship with his father that everything he did, he did because he knew that would make his father happy. He didn't sit around and go, well, should I do that or do what I want to do today? Can you imagine Jesus getting up, brother? He got up in the morning, he leaned over and looked at his disciples and said, boy, go do something. I need some me time today. 
fellas, go, just go on, you know, kind of go away for a while. Give me about four or five hours here. I'm just going to walk around and talk about how bad my life is. I need some time for myself. Come on. It was nothing about Jesus. It was all about the Father. It was nothing about the pain and the suffering that he was going through and the hurt. Let me tell you something. People will hurt you so bad. People will hurt you so bad that they will bring out an anger in you that you've never even realized you had. Can you imagine the times that Jesus could have got angry at people? But he knew I can't get angry at them. Those are God's people. I have a plan. God has a plan. My father sent me here to take care of those people and to die for those people. So I overlook myself. All right, I'm done with this. First Thessalonians 4.1 says this. Finally then, brothers... We ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. The second thing I want to give you to please God is you've got to walk right in your daily life. You want to please God? Walk right. You want to please God, get up in the morning and say, God, I know today I'm going to pay attention to what I'm doing in my life. And if I see something or the Holy Spirit speaks to me and says it's something that's not going to be pleasable to you, I'm going to avoid it. I'm going to get away from it. I'm going to change it. To please God, we have got to walk right. We've got to live right. We've got to do daily living the way that we should do it. Hebrews 11, 5 and 6 says this. By faith, Enoch was taken up. So that he should not see death and he was not found because God had taken him. Now, before he was taken, he was commended or known as having pleased God. That's the one thing you're going to find out in the Bible about Enoch. He pleased God. God was so pleased with Enoch, he took him away. Didn't even let him see death. Took him out of here. So what does that tell us? And, I, and, and the rest of that verse goes like this. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. This one here, I would tell you, if you want to please God, draw near to him and have faith in him. Draw close to him. Begin to read about him. Begin to pray and communicate with him. Praise him. Get close to him. Begin to build that faith that needs to uh, be built and that trust that you need to have in God. You want to please God? Have faith in him. Oh, yeah, I'm talking about faith when things don't look good. Faith when the bottom has fallen out. And you're falling and you don't even know how low you're going to end up. But you still have faith in him. Hebrews 13, 15, and 16. Listen to this. Through him then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of our lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have. For such sacrifices are pleasing to God. God. So what am I telling you on this verse? I'm telling you this. Sacrifice all to praise. Give all your praise to him and and do it with your mouth. Listen to me. Open your mouth and begin to praise God. Open your mouth when the troubles are coming. Sing louder than your troubles. Praise him louder than your troubles. And listen to this. Not just singing on Sundays. Do it with your mouth. All the time. Let me tell you something. There's a lot of people who miss opportunities to witness for the Lord. This is part of of pleasing God. Is being ready to open your mouth and share with somebody how good he is. I love people who always say, well, I'll pray for you. That's great. But guess what? I don't need your prayer right now. I need your help. 
Come on, let's be real. There are times when I need your help or you need somebody's help and you need it now and God has put the person there for you that can help you and you're coming to them for help and they give you the answer, I'll pray for you. Well, thank you for your prayers. And you just keep on praying while I'm sitting over here about to die. Amen? And you can answer all my problems by just helping me. Come on. I'm talking about the opportunities that we miss in pleasing God by doing and helping when we can. Opening our mouths and showing praise unto God. Let me tell you, there's no greater witness. I'm telling you now, there is no greater witness than when you share what you have been through with somebody that's going through it, and you share the word with them, and you share how God came through for you. I have sat down with so many people who have been through cancer, who have been through different things, and I sat them down, and I shared them the same feelings that I had. You had the same feelings I had. You had all these things I had, but guess what? God is bigger than cancer. God is stronger than cancer. God can heal your cancer. God can take care of you and God will do what he says he's going to do not just oh brother I'll pray for you I, again I love your prayers thank you but there are times you can pray but I need your help amen and let's remember that is a way to bless God or to please God. The last thing I want to share with you is Colossians 1 and 10 says this. So as to walk in the manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing God, bearing fruit. Uh-oh. Bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. So what am I saying in Colossians here that's going to help me please God? Number one, we've got to bear fruit. We've got to produce in the kingdom of God. We have to increase our knowledge of God. You, wanna, you want God to be pleased with you? Man, start stepping out and producing fruit and bearing fruit in your life in the kingdom of God. And then increase your knowledge of him in every way that you can. You will begin to see God and God will begin to say to you, man, I'm, I'm really happy with you. You know what? When I stand before God... I don't want to hear anything about what I was part of. I don't care. Listen, and this may sound weird to you, and I'm sorry if it does, but I'm not interest, interested in rewards, and I'm not interested in getting my name on a plate. I'm not interested in everybody uh, when they go around, and, oh, I can go Pastor Gray. I'm not interested in that. What I'm interested in is I want to stand before God someday and have him look down from the throne at me and say, I am so pleased with you. I am so pleased with you that you did everything that I asked you to do. You didn't do everything perfectly, and I'm so glad that you didn't because you would start thinking it was all about you. Come on. Sometimes we need to remember that. Sometimes we don't do everything perfect because God wants us to remember we're not. And we need him. We need to please God. God, not man. If you have things in your life that you're doing right now just to please other people and God is saying to you, you need to quit doing that. You need to get away from that. It's a detriment to you. It's separating you from me. It's causing all kinds of spiritual problems in your life. If you got things going on like that, you need to get before God and say, God, I got to get rid of this. I can't have this anymore because I need to please you. I need to please you. So again, I share these things with you today because I believe they will help you. I believe they will help us. If we could ever get to the place to where we have a disdain for this world and disdain against sin. I can remember standing, and I won't share the name because you know them, but I remember standing in the room when a dear friend of mine passed away. Took his last breath, and I was standing there, Dean and I was standing bedside, and we were with the family, and there was young girls, and, and one of the girls came up to me and hugged me and tears in her eyes and said, why did God do this? And if you know me very much, you've heard me say this a lot, I hate sin. 
And I looked at that young girl, and the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, tell her the truth. And I looked at her, and I said, babe, God had nothing to do with this. This is sin. Sin caused your daddy to die. It was sin that was introduced into man and into life. And God had to stand back because he's God. He had to stand back, keep his word, and stay back. And things had to happen. And now we're all going to have to die because of sin. And I looked at her and I said, if you do anything from this moment to the rest of your life, hate sin. Go after it. Go against it. I get up in the morning, I tell you this, and I mean this with all my heart, I'm praying these last few prayers, and I've been praying a certain way. I've been praying, God, let me please you so much that when I get up in the morning, Satan starts to get nervous. Uh Uh-oh, he's up. Wouldn't that be awesome? To be living in God and living the way that we need to live and being live, living so close to God that we've gone after him to a place to where when we get up in the morning and we put our feet on the floor, the devil's saying, oh my God, he's up. What's he going to do now? I believe it's happening. God is preparing a remnant for these last days. I had somebody say, I just... I, can't believe in this rapture thing and I said oh you better start (laughs) you better get you better wise up and start because it's coming and I believe it's coming soon and I believe God wants us to be a part of the net that he's casting do you realize that he's casting a net And that net is put together with you and I. He's casting it, man. Getting it out there as far as he can get it. To pull in as many as he can pull in. And he's going to use us. But it takes going after him. Giving up the selfishness of life and giving up the things that we've been spending all of our time on. And start focusing on God being first in our lives. How many want to see your loved ones saved? How many want to see sickness defeated? How many of you want to see blessings physically and and financially and in your relationships, see the blessings of God begin to flow like they've never flowed before? How many want to see your relationship with God built to a place to where you just feel him with you all the time? Those things are happening, but it takes us going after him. Setting our minds to say, I'm going after him. I'm going after him. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. How many in this place will raise their hand and say, Pastor, I find out I'm going after the world sometimes and I need to go after God. Come on, get them hands up there. Let God see them. Amen. There are so many branches to this message that I wish I could do, but I, time won't allow it. But I think the thing that's going to cause us to want to go after him more and more is to see our need for him more and more. To see how much I need him. To see how much I can't live without him. And I believe God's going to begin to do that. He's going to put a hunger inside of us. I'm going to ask you to come, if you will. We're going to pray together in our final prayer at the altar as a church body. It all comes down, I'm telling you. This whole walk, this whole walk comes down to 
What are you going to give him? What are you going to give him? The more we hold on to, the more the devil has weapons to come against us. The more we give him, wow, the more he has control. It comes down to how, how much we're going to give him. Some of you, I hope this message challenged you. I hope it made you look within yourself and say, man, there are things in my life I need to get rid of. I need to get them out. You may be here saying, I just don't know how that's going to happen. I, I don't see any hope in getting rid of this or getting this out of my life. But I, I, I tell you right now, your hope is in Christ Jesus. He's the one that's going to do it. You just need to focus on him. Say, God, these things I can't do. They're here, and I want them. I want what you want. My desire is your desire. And you watch him work. He'll do his work. You know, I was praying this morning, and I wrote this down. To press. The first thing we need to do to press is the P. We need to pray and praise him continually if you're going to press and push through you're going to have to do it with prayer and praise that's the first thing you're going to have to do the second thing you're going to have to do is remember have a good memory of how good God is and what God has done for you you talking about pressing through when someone has done something good for me and I feel like I owe them and you may say well I can't pay God back but let me tell you something I still feel like I owe him I owe it to him to live right and do the things right. And as I look and my memory kicks in and I start to remember the goodness of God, it gives me strength that I need to keep pushing for what he's done for me. Then that E, we have to engage. Man, we got to engage in the kingdom work. We got to engage ourselves in, in worship. We got to engage ourselves in reading the Bible. We got to engage ourselves in studies we got to engage ourselves in getting to know him more. And then we have those two S's on the end. The first one, sacrifice. It takes self-sacrifice. If you're going to press and push through and go after God, you're going to have to sacrifice. There's going to be some losses. Paul called them losses. If Paul called them losses, they meant something to him. At one time, it meant something to Paul for him to say, I count them loss. In other words, I used to, they used to be important to me, but now they're not. I lost them. We've got to look at that. We've got to begin to say, man, I've got to sacrifice some things. And then that last S, serve. Man, if we're going to push through, we've got to serve. We've got to serve one another. See, sometimes we forget this. This body is put here together because God set you here to take care of one another, to love one another, to hold on to each other, to pray for one another, to, to, to help each other get through the situations that we're going through. God put us here to serve. We got to serve. Reach out, touch somebody. We're going to pray. Father, right now, I thank you I thank you, Lord, that you're the answer to everything in our lives. God, we don't have to go to four or five different places. Lord, we don't have to go like we do in the flesh sometimes. God, we don't have to go to this specialist, and now we got to go see this specialist, and we got to go over here and see this specialist now to get to the root of the problem or find out what's going on. We come to one place, and that's you. <laughs> we come to you, the author and the finisher of our faith, the one who has the answer to everything that we go through. God, we're coming to you this morning because, Lord, we want to go after you. Lord, there are some in this room right now and, and, and some that were by social media. God, I believe with all my heart. Their heart is wanting to come after you, but the world and the things of this world won't let them. And God, I'm praying right now that that will be broken. 
that those chains and those fetters, God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, will begin to break away. And God, we will come after you like we've never come after you before. God, I pray for grace and mercy to flow in every life that's in this place today. God, I pray that from this moment on, you will begin to speak to us in a way that, Lord, will manifest things in our lives and cause us to want and desire the best to please you. Not to please self, not to please someone else, but to please you. Father, we thank you for that. God, give us the mercy and the grace and the strength to fight the battles that we face every day. Lord, help us love one another, keep each other in good care. God, right now, I just ask you, Lord, to move in a special way. Do it, Father. Let the anointing of God flow on every family in this room. God, let them see you in the land of living. Let them see you in their lives. God, I pray today, thank you for your word because it makes us strong. It encourages us. It challenges us. And it's a light unto our path and a lamp unto our feet. Thank you, Father, for your word. Help us today, Father, I pray. We just pray and we give you all the glory, Father, in your precious name. And everybody said amen. Amen. Let's give God another hand clap of praise. Amen. God is so good. So good. He's so faithful. Don't forget Wednesday night, if you would, we're going to have our study starting up. Doc's got, Doc's like a lion in a cage, ready to go. So we're excited about it. Amen. Seven o'clock on Wednesday night. God bless you. We love you.